Huh. Yes, actually, it was a it was a moment. It, you know, sometimes books happen because they dawn on you gradually. But this was this book started with a question. I had written five books on plant and animal adaptations, basically. So I was, you know, really swimming in this whole uh, sea of information about how exquisitely organisms are adapted to their places and how behaviorally in their bodies, how, how, they're, how they're matched form to function to, to really excel in their places and to actually enhance their places rather than degrade them. And I realized that and I said, well, you know, if they, if they know how to build soil and clean air and clean water and make their habitat even better than it was when they got there, which is what life tends to do, why aren't we, is anyone trying to emulate them? I literally said, you know, are there, is there anyone in the scientific literature who I can find who's going from not just learning about nature, but learning from nature, taking that emulation step? This was about 1990 and I began to find all kinds of things in the scientific literature. It was a faint signal. It wasn't in media yet at all. It was in very obscure journals. Um, and it was called different things. I mean, the people who were looking to organisms for how they self-medicate, that was called zoopharmacognosy. And the people who were looking at prairies to create a whole new form of sustainable agriculture, that was called natural systems agriculture. And there were a bunch of people looking at how spiders um, make their silk without heating or beating or treating, a whole new way of manufacturing. Uh, that was called biomimetic materials. But no one really had an overarching you know, word for this. It was happening in business. It was happening in medicine, energy. And at that point, I realized you know, this is, there's a golden thread going through all of this work. And it's that we're looking to our biological elders for advice about new, new technologies, new chemical recipes, new strategies for how to organize ourselves. Um, so finally saying, you know, here's, here's a word, biomimicry, that would pull all of these things together and so that we can begin to self-identify as people who look to nature for advice. You know, the, the really exciting thing in biomimicry right now is that it's not in academia alone anymore. Now it's moving into corporate R&D labs, corporate innovation labs. Companies are looking for breakthrough innovations. Um, what's nice about biomimicry is that you, you tend to find a breakthrough innovation, but it also tends to be sustainable. So say you're looking for a way to desalinate water, um, people who have looked to the ways our own body desalinates water, for instance, or how fish desalinate or how mangroves desalinate, they find that the membranes are very, very different from how we do it. It's a breakthrough innovation. It's a really flip in our thinking. Um, nature tends to do things with common raw materials. Business needs that right now and in the era of peak everything. Um, it tends to do things with uh, a minimal of energy. Um, and obviously with peak oil, uh, companies are looking for that as well. Um, and the designs are elegant. They're, they're surprising. They're, they're things that we haven't thought of. For instance, a, a company might want to know how to uh, create a, a kind of paint without toxins. But then they'll learn that the most brilliant organisms in the natural world don't use paint. They don't use pigment even. You know, things like peacocks, morpho butterflies. They use structure, structural color. They use transparent layering and light comes through and creates the color to your eye. That's a breakthrough. If instead of painting we were to put down transparent films and allow light to create the color to our eyes, we get away from this idea of toxic dyes. Um, so, so for companies, I, I think it, it offers um, breakthrough technologies and sustainability comes with the milk. It, 
it's interesting because many of our clients, after you know, we solve particular challenges, and we'll be asked, you know, how does nature insulate, or how does nature filter, or lubricate, or create color, or, and we'll come up with mechanisms in the natural world. But many of our clients, um, after a while of working with us, they say, are there any design principles that apply to all organisms? Are there any universal design principles? And so we, we did. We came up with a list of life's principles um, that, as far as we can tell as scientists, it applies to all life forms on the planet. That is as close to an operating manual for how to be an earthling as you can get. And when you go through these, right now we have about 25. It's an evolving thing. And there are things like life runs on current sunlight. Life does its chemistry in water, not toxic solvents. Um, life builds from the bottom up with common building blocks, a small subset of the periodic table. When you look at some of those design principles, um, you realize, number one, how different our story of stuff is. Um, but you also realize that you're looking at a code for how to rewrite the story of stuff in a way that's, that's proven, guaranteed, in a sense, to allow us to fit in here on this planet, um, which in the long run uh, is far more important than quarterly profits. Fitting in here over the long run uh, is is something we should be we should be investigating and, and organizing ourselves to do. Uh, and these this code, these life's principles, we ignore them at our peril. Um, and we embracing them brings us brings us out of risk and guesswork, <laughs> and brings us towards um, being like the other organisms that have been here for up to 3.8 billion years. So we can leapfrog, with their help, we can leapfrog um, to be a welcome species on the planet. Silence. I'd wish for a lack of, a lack of sound. And I would I would wish for um, the recognition that, that most long-surviving, mature ecosystems run on cooperation. Competition is short and brutish and too energy intensive to stay engaged in for long. So I would wish for a recognition that cooperation is the most natural thing in the world. Not that nature is red in tooth and claw. <laughs> it's a lot more symbiotic and mutualism um, that you see in the natural world than, than we hear about in business textbooks. <laughs>